So the end is here, y'all. Crazy, huh? Um, there's times where you feel like this day is never going to get here, and then, oh my God, it's here. <laughs> right? um, so let me first say it's been a pleasure, right? Um, for those of you guys that traipse out first thing in the morning, uh, I appreciate your timeliness. Um, and uh, I forgot to mention last time, because we're kind of speeding through things. Instead of doing a discussion board for this unit, um, especially since the time really got scrunched this semester, we ran out of time. Um, I, I do. I've been doing a case study the past couple of semesters, and the students seem to really like that. So one of the things you'll notice too next week, there'll be um, one last assignment for you guys. It's probably the easiest one all semester long. It's my uh, course survey, end of the semester course survey that I always do for my classes. Um, so of course, one of the questions I'm going to ask you is, did you prefer this over doing, say, a discussion board um, and some other questions like that? Because um, I really do listen to what you guys have to say, right? And I do make changes to my course based on, you know, um, suggestions that students make, um, or when I make a suggestion, if students say yes or no to it. Um, so I give you, I really value your input so much so that I give you points for doing it, right? So you get 15 points for completing the survey um, uh, on time. So, um, so for this one, it's a it's a case study. It's actually from a book. It's a pretty good book. I have it on reserve at the library too. If you want to look at the actual book itself, this case study book. Um, so you can read through um, the case study. You can even print this out and bring it with you to the test, right? Because it is going to be on the test because it does cover one of the diseases covered in your book. So that's where you go to get your answers, right? And some of the questions in the case study itself, um, I didn't like the way it was worded, or I can't remember the reasoning why, <laughs> thinking back now, honestly, um, that I kind of pared down the questions from the case study itself. I clicked the wrong button. Um, so you'll see this other document questions list here. This is probably the one you most definitely want to print out and write your answers on, right? Um, so um, I kind of maybe even asked some additional questions. I'm not sure. But these are the ones that I, I really want you guys to know the answers to. And your book is going to help you answer these questions on Listeria, right? But obviously, you're going to have to read the case study itself. It's going to ask you questions about the case study itself as well. So how these two things come together. So um, definitely complete that. Um, and how you're going to complete that is you're going to, you know, read, read in your book, answer those questions on that page I just showed you, and then you're going to click this link right here and actually um, submit a quiz on it. But again, you get to have your notes in front of you, right? Um, and it's going to tell you the answers, too. So you can jot down on your sheet, too, anything that you may have not understand or got wrong, right, to bring with you to the test uh, on Thursday morning. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. I answered all your questions? Okay. All right. <laughs> and I was going to go over it last time. I just lost time. So that's just as well. Don't forget, right, there are connect assignments, right? Do, 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 do complete those before Thursday, right? Um, it's going to help you make sure that your notes are accurate, right, um, that you're getting all the information you're supposed to get. Um, so the other thing I'll do as soon as class ends is I'll post the PowerPoints that I'm using today for the last two topics um, that we're going to talk about today. And then, of course, this this recording. And remember, you can, um, you would have had to submit by now, right, because class already started. Um, you writing out the objectives yourself or typing them out, you would, for bonus points, you had to submit it by this morning, right? But, of course, you also have the added bonus of you can bring them with you to the test on Thursday. Once you get done taking the test on Thursday, you call me over, you show me, you scroll down that you've completed, you've answered all the questions. Now you're probably going to maybe have a lot of them marked, right, that you want to go back and look at your notes maybe. Um, and then you're allowed to look at your notes, right? You're not going to have your notes the whole time of the test. You have to make sure you go through and answer all the questions before you look at your notes. Does that make sense to you guys? That's how you should take an open notes test, right, so you don't run out of time. Uh, and so that you look at things logically and systematically, right? Um, so, all right. So into, I'm going to go over nervous system first um, this morning. So our first objectives for nervous system are list the main components of the nervous system. 
and describe the routes a pathogen can take to enter the central nervous system. So how is it that they get to the central nervous system? How are they able to cause infection? How do they get there? And there's just three routes, actually. So what is uh, your central nervous system? Your central nervous system is just your brain and your spinal cord. right? It's centrally located, hence the name central nervous system. If there is a network of nerves, though, that run throughout the body coming from the spinal cord. These are referred to as your peripheral nervous system. Now, of course, the fear is infection in the system because, or I should say infection of the central nervous system is the most concerning. Um, because it is central and paramount to our survival, right? Um, it is the command um, of everything, our brain and spinal cord. So there is um, a series of membranes that surround the brain and spinal cord. They're referred to as the meninges. When these become inflamed, this is referred to as meningitis. Now, an itis just means inflammation. Meningitis meaning an inflammation of the meninges. As we're going to talk about, several things can cause an inflammation of that area of the body, right? So if someone says you have meningitis, that's really not enough information, right, as far as a doctor or um, somebody trying to treat you. Um, that's not enough information. Um, the spinal cord itself can be infected, right? There's one infection um, that will do that. That's poliomyelitensis, and that is caused by a virus. The brain itself can be infected, um, and there are several different uh, viruses that can cause an infection of the brain, as well as bacteria. Um, commonly, the brain itself, when it's infected, is referred to as an encephalitis, and this, of course, is the most life-threatening of all the infections of the central nervous system. And then one that is very specific to and that it attacks the brain is rabies. And that's caused, of course, by a virus. One of the complementing complicating factors of infections of the central nervous system is the fact that the brain and the spine are encased in what other than the membranes? They're encased in fluid, right? And what are vertebrae? What's your skull made out of? Bone. Is that flexible? No. It is not flexible when you're an adult. When you're a baby, right, the, the, it's not all sealed up for the skull, right? So in that case, yes, still somewhat flexible. And when you're a young adult, um, I mean, when you're a young child, but when you're an adult, that's fixed. So if you have swelling, right, you have inflammation of the meninges, these membranes surrounding the brain, do you have room for this to expand? No, it pushes up against the bones, right, of the skull, of the spinal cord, your vertebrae. And, and it has no place to go, so then it pushes back on that sensitive tissue, right, on the brain and on the spinal cord. So that's why sometimes, especially for when you have swelling of the brain, what do they do? They literally screw, they literally drill a hole in your skull to relieve the pressure, right, of that fluid so that you don't crush the brain. Does that make sense to you guys? Right? That's the, that's the really scary. I mean, why do we, so it's like, well, why did we stick it in skull? Why did we stick it in bone then, right, if, we, if it won't stretch? Because, no, not, it wasn't for protect, oh, it was protection, you're right, I thought you said infection. Protection, right, because it is a, a vital organ, right, having that bone adds an extra layer of protection, but, you know, with any protection out there, there's no one perfect way to protect something, right? Um, my family used to laugh at me before I figured out what was wrong <laughs> with me as far as um, being intolerant to gluten. It really screwed up my life. And I would be very clumsy. You know, I was always bumping into things because I was tired. I wasn't sleeping right. And and my mom said that she was going to make me a bubble suit. She was going to make me a suit out of bubble wrap. 
right? <laughs> to keep me from, from uh, walking into things and hurting myself. Um, the good news is all I had to do is cut gluten out of my diet and I'm doing great. Uh, no bubble wrap needed for me anymore and I sleep amazing. <laughs> but, um, you know, this, the, and then of course bubble wrap wasn't going to protect me against everything either, right? And that probably would look really ridiculous. But, <laughs> um, so the and meninges, as I said, are membranes that cover the surface of the brain and the spinal cord. And again, when someone says meningitis, they're just referring to inflammation of that particular area in the body. Um, we really have to delve deeper into as to what potentially is causing it. Um, so for that, the one good news as opposed to sinus infections, right, um, where we really can't get a sample, um, not all that easily anyways, um, for the in for the spinal cord, we can get a sample of that fluid that bathes the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and the safest place to do this is down in the lumbar region. So actually at the furthest part of the lumbar region of the vertebrae. Um, the spinal cord itself tapers to very thin. And so when they go in with the needle to be able to take a sample of the fluid, they're less likely to damage the nerves themselves of the spinal cord. Um, and so that's why they do it in that particular region. And they're going to take a sample of that fluid. So how did a pathogen, say, get there? How did it get into the meninges, into the spinal fluid? The most common way is via the bloodstream. Right, so chief source, when we're usually dealing with central nervous system infections, we're dealing with um, something that got there in, from the blood. And this typically happens when the pathogen, of course, gets into our bloodstream. Now, this could be because it directly entered into the bloodstream, or because it's grown in one particular area in the body and has got to such large numbers that it has spread into the blood. Right. And so this is the concern with infection, right? If it goes too long, it could get into the bloodstream. When it's in the bloodstream in high concentration, the likelihood of it being able to pass into the central nervous system is greater, right? We do have protection there, right? We really kind of, um, the nutrients that are taken from the blood to make the central, uh, to make the fluid, the cerebral fluid, it is pretty picky, right? Um, but that barrier can be breached, and the likelihood increases with the more pathogens you have in your blood, right? The higher level um, that exists in your blood with infection. But this also creates a problem, too, in that, the, you know, we're really picky as to what we let into this area of the body. So most of the time, right, when you get an infection, you don't have to worry about it really getting there, right? You have to worry when we get to really high levels in the blood that then the likelihood becomes greater that it's going to cross that barrier, what we call the, the uh, blood-brain barrier. But this also creates a problem with treatment, right? Because when we take antibiotics, they go into the bloodstream, and then they go to where they need to go, right? This makes treatment difficult because the same is true for antibiotics. We've got to, a lot of times, give them very higher than normal concentrations, usually intravenously right into the blood, so that they can get to high enough levels that they can cross that blood-brain barrier, right? And so that creates really scary, difficult situations as it relates to um, infections <coughs> of the central nervous system. Does that make sense to you guys? So that's our main concern right there, is getting into the blood in such high numbers that it crosses that barrier and gets into the central nervous system. Another one that's not very common but does happen is actually traveling up the nerves themselves. Right, So the pathogen gets into the nerve cells and travels up the nerve cells. There's one specific virus that definitely does this. This is how it gains entry to the brain. Anyone know what virus that is? Hmm? Mm -mm. It's on this very short list. 
rabies, rabies, right? Because it eventually affects the brain. Well, usually you get bit, say, maybe on the hand or the leg or something like that, right? Trying to run away from a crazy rabid animal. Because most of us know to avoid them to begin with, right? <laughs> so you would be running away. So what if you do come in contact with their saliva, right? Because that's how it's transmitted via their saliva. Via a wound you have or the fact that they bit you, full on bit you. It actually travels from the nerves in that periphery all the way up to the brain. That's how it gets there. The other is extensions from the bone, right? So where it gets into the sinuses or the mastoids or even the middle ear and actually travels through the bone to the brain. <clears throat> And most of the time, we don't ever hear of something like this, right? But unfortunately, a local water system had an issue with the pathogen in that water supply that could do this. Anybody know what type of organism that was and what we were worried about? Close. It, it wasn't a paramecium, but it's in that same group of organisms we refer to as protozoa. It was an amoeba. It was an amoeba. It was an amoeba right, where if individuals were exposed to the water, if the water went up your nose and got into your sinuses, it could potentially pass through the bone to the brain. And that's how it would cause death, right, brain-eating amoeba. It's true. It really does exist. It really does happen. Um, so the bad news with that, right, is that I think there was a little girl in that parish that died, huh, from swimming in water contaminated with that uh, microbe. And the other caution they have for individuals, and anybody who actually uses these um, neti pots, right, or those nasal rinses where you, you make your own um, salt solution and spray it up your nose. Um, I use it occasionally to rinse out all the pollen out of my nose, right, to lessen the extent of um, exposure I have to it and reaction to pollen. If you read the instructions for those things, they tell you to use distilled water. This is the reason for that. You don't want to stick any water up there, right, that could potentially contain pathogens that could, you know, pass through the bone, like the case of the brain-eating amoeba, right? Um, you're not supposed to use tap water when you do things like that, right? Um, and then this is also one of the main reasons when you go swimming, right, um, especially in a pool, what do we do to um, prevent infection with that? We just, we just fill up the pool with any water, no problem, just go swimming, what the heck. No, we, we're going to use things, we're going to use things like disinfectants, like chlorine, or nowadays it's more popular to use salt because it's not as harsh on the skin, right? And other additives to help purify and test the water to make sure that it doesn't contain large numbers of microorganisms that could cause infection, right? Limit our exposure to infection. Um, so, um, natural waters, right? When you go swimming in lakes and streams and things like that, you really should not do what? You shouldn't drink it, for one, for sure. You really shouldn't go under the water, right? Um, or if you do, like my, my son's swimming lessons, they teach him, what do you do? You blow bubbles, right? You force air out so that water can't go in, right? Because, again, you don't really want that water going in because you don't know what's in it. Right? Well, poses a, a, a hazard. Uh, yeah. Potential hazard. Make sense? So these are the three main ways, right? The blood is the main reason why we end up with central nervous system infections. It can travel through the nerves, and one of the key chief examples of this is rabies. And then it can extend through the bone, and unfortunately we've dealt with brain eating amoeba that can do this. So as I said, when you say um, meningitis, you're just referring to an inflammation of the meninges. We can go one step further, right, especially if we take a sample of the cerebral fluid, we can kind of deduce on whether it's bacterial versus what other pathogen could potentially be there. If you have meningitis, is it definitely you've got a bacterial infection? No, it could also be what? It could be a parasite. It could be a protozoa. 
What's the other more likely thing that we run into? That we really actually don't have a lot of treatment for. We really rely on our immune system to take care of these invaders. Viruses. <coughs> Viruses. Right? So a lot of times they're going to take that sample because we want to figure out what are we dealing with, right? So if it's bacterial, we may even recover bacteria. The other thing they'll test is the glucose level in that fluid. The glucose level dramatically drops when you're dealing with a bacterial infection because the bacteria are going to eat the sugar, right, that's in that fluid. You also tend to have an influx of neutrophils, right, because you've got inflammation in that area, right? So neutrophils are coming in to try and kill the invader from the blood. So, you know, they're going to take a sample, they're going to stain it under the microscope, they're going to be looking for the bacteria themselves, they're going to look for what white blood cells are there, if neutrophils are there, right, that's a pretty good sign that we we'll probably have bacterial infection. They're going to look at the level of glucose, if that's dropped, that's another sure sign that we're dealing with a bacterial infection. If you don't see an increase in neutrophils, you don't see a change in glucose level, that's a pretty strong indicator that we're dealing with what instead? What did we say a minute ago? A virus, right? And again, we're not going to see those under the microscope either, right? So the most common bacterial meningitis offenders, right? Um, and I had a really nice clue on the last test for you guys for this one. Um, Hemophilus influenzae. Um, you have a, a vaccine against this, right? It is the HIBA vaccine. It's H-A-B or I-B, H-A-H-I-A-B or H-A-B, right? Um, and the B stands for um, that serotype for that particular bacteria, right? There's a particular strain that we're of um, concern with. And so we've already talked about this one previously because where else does it typically cause infections, which really increases the risk of it going to the brain? Where do we talk about this guy? Sinus and ear infections, right? This is one of those offenders for sinus and ear infections. Um, Nisseria uh, meningitis is the most common um, that we deal with with outbreaks of bacterial meningitis. Um, and it's transmitted respiratorily, so that's the scary thing with that. Uh, we do have a vaccine against the four different most commonly causative types. And again, we, we can have problems where it spreads to epidemic proportions. And mostly young people are, are sus the most susceptible to this. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, this one, again, respiratorily transmitted. Uh, we do have a vaccine against multiple types. This is one of the vaccines that they really were pushing for a long time. I don't know if they've continued to. For people going away to college, right, living in dormitories and close contact, situations like that, uh, away from home, you know, so you're not, you don't, aren't not under the supervision of your parents anymore, right? Um, so you don't have that extra set of eyes looking out for when you're not uh, feeling so great. Um, and so, you know, we've had a lot of, you know, um, college students away from home die from meningitis, um, something could be, could have been prevented by vaccine, um, and really could have been prevented too by very prompt treatment, and that's the problem with it. It has to be very prompt, the, the treatment, because this can, think about this. If it's gotten into your brain, it's already been in your body, right, in your lungs, into your bloodstream for a long period of time, so you're dealing with debilitation. Um, but it can move really rapidly. Um, this next one, Streptococcus um, L, uh, I always have trouble saying this one, um, this is the one that they test women for. This is when they do what's referred to as the beta strep test. Um, they're looking for this particular organism because, unfortunately, um, some women we have as part of our normal flora in the vagina. 
The problem that with that is that when you give birth, the baby passes through the vagina. That's the birth canal, right? Um, and can come in contact with this organism and get very, very sick from it. Um, and again, it can travel very quickly um, to the brain. Um, so uh, neonates, right, newborns, are most susceptible to this. So they'll test mom before she gives birth. And if she has it, they're going to give her antibiotics to um, uh, get rid of the infection before she gives birth. Unfortunately, one of my students in my other class, her sister just gave birth to twins. And she was tested three weeks, three weeks, which I'm, I'm thinking that's a little too early um, for this infection. And she was negative. But apparently she acquired it between then and giving birth. And her baby got an infection and um, one of the twins got an infection and uh, almost died. The last I heard it was still in the NICU. So, you know, um, not not something to, to play around with. Um, and it's why these types of things can be avoided, right? But we need to make sure that we do what we need to do to avoid them. Um, no vaccines for this, right? But we can treat with um, antibiotics. E. coli, too, this is another one that will create problems for the neonate. Um, this is why we want to be relatively clean as we can be um, uh, in the birthing process and not expose the baby to any feces. Um, not to gross any of you guys out, but they'll literally, like, scoop it out of you to make sure your baby doesn't come in contact with it and clean you up. Um, to avoid that contact because as we know, right, you don't want any of that getting into the baby's um, system. Um, and then listeria, you guys, right, have that case study that you're going to work on with this and, you know, um, as it goes over in that case study, um, it's a pregnant woman, right, and she ate something um, that contained listeria in it and um, almost lost her baby because of it. So uh, for meningococcal meningitis, um, and so again, we're really talking about bacterial meningitis here. And so typically when someone says meningococcal meningitis, they're talking about Nisseria meningitis. This one under the microscope is a diplococcyx, which means that typically you're going to see two cocci next to each other in pairs. And it's gram negative. All right, so they'll do a quick gram stain. If they're seeing round cocci in pairs that are pink, all right, that's a pretty sure sign that we're dealing with um, necessaria meningitis. How do these guys cause infection, right? What's its pathogenicity? Well, they have papillae that adhere to our epithelial cells specifically in the respiratory tract, hence why it's respiratorily transmitted, right? You inhale res infected respiratory droplets. They attach, right? We're not able to sweep them away with the mucus in the ciliated cells of the respiratory tract. So they can colonize the upper respiratory, and then they can enter from there into the bloodstream. And when they get to high enough numbers, they can cross over the blood-brain barrier and enter into the spinal fluid. Then we get the inflammatory process, right? And that even obstructs the flow of the central um, nervous system fluid, the cerebral fluid, which feeds the brain and spinal cord. This also increases the pressure, right? Because we've got this blockage, we don't have the movement of fluid, we got fluid building up in areas. So we can even get damage to the nerves themselves, which will produce paralysis. And then the really scary thing, especially with this one being a gram-negative, is gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane, right, made of LPS, lipopolysaccharide. That is a toxin to us. When those cells die, that's not the end of the story for us. Those substances are released. That lipid A component of lipopolysaccharide is toxic to us and can cause an even more aggressive inflammatory response by our immune system 
but this in this case right this is an over response this is more response that we need right when we're coming exposed to this endotoxin the bacteria is dead right we don't need this stress this you know exas exacerbated excessive response in this case it's more damaging than it's helpful uh, and that's a really scary thing with this is that you know if not treated properly or correctly we can actually make the system worse right by releasing too much endotoxin too quickly with treatment but again you know we do have you know antibiotics that can be used um, against the bacteria and we do have several vaccines that are available against several different strains So as you can see, because of education, knowledge about the infection, um, the resources we have in vaccination, the numbers of cases, the incidence, which is adjusted for population, has decreased dramatically over the years. So why is listeria often contracted from contaminated food or drink? So what did you guys find out? About this particular bacteria, Listeria uh, monocytogenes. Or is this like harsh temperature, like a vacuum, vacuum sealing thing, is in cold temperature temperatures and stuff? It can grow at refrigerator temperatures, right? So one of the main things that we do to help protect us against pathogens and to decrease their growth in our foods is to refrigerate. This guy will grow in the refrigerator. You're not slowing it down at all. Right, so it can grow at four degrees Celsius. That's about what your refrigerator is at. So epidemics occur, right, and the problem with this one is again it gets into the bloodstream, and then that's how it can get um, to the meninges and cause meningitis. The problem for pregnant women is it can also cross the placenta. Right, and the women usually don't get too terribly sick sometimes, um, but it can be life-threatening to the baby. It can cause... Um, infection and miscarriage and death of the baby or baby born with the infection. Other than pregnant women, most of us would handle it just fine, right? Um, actually be able to clear it from our system on our own. It's people whose immune system are compromised, right? Uh, if they've got some other problem going on like cancer or, or, di or diabetic, Right, are, are at greater risk for, for this developing into a life-threatening infection and, and, and be able to progress to meningitis. So good old Bluebell, right, had the Listeria outbreak, <laughs> which wasn't so cool. Um, you know, and uh, so in that case, you know, think about it, you know, it's frozen too. It doesn't mean it's killing the bacteria. And that's the thing that people don't realize, too, is that, you know, freezing doesn't kill most bacteria. It just stops them for a period of time. Once you take it out of the freezer, it starts right back up again, especially this guy. And then women um, who are pregnant, of course, because of that risk of it being passed to the baby via the placenta, are suggested not to eat certain foods that are more likely to be uh, contaminated with it. So, of course, never raw meat and for people in general. It's not a good idea because there's other pathogens. Um, but vegetables can become contaminated. You want to thoroughly wash them. Uh, you want to reheat cold cuts. Um, so if you want bologna, have a fried bologna sandwich, which actually is the only way I prefer to eat it. Right. Um, you know, uh, hot dogs are fine, right? They, you know, suggest that you don't eat them. But they're really fine if you cook them. But a lot of people... Right, because this really is a pre-cooked meat, just like bologna. Um, we'll eat it straight out of the refrigerator, right? Um, so what doctors don't say to pregnant women is it's okay if you cook it. So they just tell you like not to eat it, right? And of course, when you're pregnant, you want everything you can't have, right? 
that's the way it goes. But in truth, you can have them. Just cook them. And don't do like the idiot did in the case study that you guys are going to read about if you haven't already. <laughs> um, refrigerate leftovers. Um, refrigerated leftovers. Um, you want to, if you're not going to heat it back up again, don't eat it. Just don't eat it, you know, if you're pregnant or at risk. Because as we know, it can grow in the refrigerator. So why is um, botulism generally um, not an infectious disease? So what, what does infectious disease mean anyways? Right, you, can, you can get it usually from someone or something, right? You can get this infection. Do you really get an infection if you have botulism? Do you really have an infection? Is bacteria growing in your body? Most of the time when we say someone has botulism, they actually don't have the infection with the bacteria. Instead, they've ingested something that the bacteria produces, which is what? The toxin. The toxin. Now, you can, you can get a botulism infection, right? Um, but it's less likely. Um, it's an anaerobe for one, right? So you've got to have the right kind of conditions for it to grow. It's gram-positive spore former. This is the scary part, is the spores are in the environment. Most commonly what happens is our food gets contaminated with this. It grows in the food and produces the toxins that we then ingest. Again, when you ingest the bacteria, it usually doesn't take up residency, doesn't colonize or anything. But that absorption of that toxin is what creates the problems. So that's why it's not, usually, it's not an infectious disease, right? We don't really worry about getting an infection of the bacteria that causes this, but ingesting the toxins that it produces. So contamination of home cans non-acid foods that are not heated enough to kill the spores. The spores are widespread in the soil, right? Aquatic sediment and dust. It can colonize the intestines of adults and infants with deficiencies to your normal flora. Because remember, for the most part, you've got to overcome the normal flora when you come on scene. So if you have a normal, right, nice, good ecosystem of, of normal flora going in your intestines, the chances of this guy being able to take up residency when he comes by is very slim. He's not a very good fighter, right? He's, he's only going to be able to, to take up residence if everybody else is pretty much gone or not on their, not on their game. Wounds, right? We talked about wounds, right? Wounds can sometimes become anaerobic, right? Especially puncture wounds. Wounds we have a lot of dead tissue, like burns. And then, of course, people who use injected drugs, abuse injected drugs, you're creating puncture wounds all the time when you're doing that. So that predisposes you more likely to actually getting an infection um, by this organism. So what's the problem? Well, as we said, it's actually the toxin. It's the type of toxin. It's actually a neurotoxin. The toxin acts by blocking the transmission of nerve signals to the muscles, resulting in paralysis. Again, Wounds could potentially get infected. Intestines could potentially, but it's rare, right? The more commonly that people get this type of, um, or have this type of infection, not really an infection, right? Type of problem is ingesting the toxin itself. So cans are what type of environment? Anaerobic, right? And they say beware of the swollen can. Right? And that be, that's because something grew in that can, right? Since it was canned, that's why it's swollen. 
Those are the ones you don't mess with. You can't smell the toxin. Like the bacteria could have grown and died, but it left the toxin behind, y'all. You're not going to smell this. The good news, though, is, is if you're going to heat whatever it is you're cooking, it is a heat-liable toxin. You can destroy it with heat. Right? So again, properly cooking foods really helps you with um, food poisoning. Make sense? All right. And in and, and the canning industry, it's strictly regulated to try and make sure that these spores, this bacteria, doesn't get into the food um, so that we don't have to worry about the risk of this type of infection. But <laughs> we don't always succeed, right? Um, and this is the problem, too, with mass-produced food in one location and then chipped all over the United States, right? Um, is that we, we, we've had several outbreaks from food becoming contaminated um, at the source, at the major big uh, food processing plant. So this just gives you some examples of, of some of the major outbreaks um, that we've had in the past. And again, linked to um, processed foods and mass distribution, mass distribution of processed foods. So um, even more. Th this actually is not processed food. This I found kind of interesting. Uh, Pruno. Um, do they give you the description here? An illicit alcoholic brew in the Arizona prison um, is what led to that particular outbreak. And apparently, um, also in Utah, they had uh, the same problem. So, you know, prison is making alcohol illegally. And ingesting it and making themselves sick. Not good. Um, and then um, some other cases that they've had, notice um, home canned um, spaghetti meat sauce. This is the problem with that is the meat component, right, um, with that. Um, I have lots of friends that, you know, um, home can, um, but you got to be really careful with what you're doing. Um, and she's like, I specifically just don't mess with meat because that poses a greater risk. Um, but it can happen to... Um, vegetables and whatnot as well um, can become contaminated. So, uh, and this is infants, right, where their intestines actually get um, infected. So the next one is Hansen's disease. Um, that's the PC name for what we commonly know as leprosy. And what's very distinct about this particular bacterial infection unlike many, many others. This guy really prefers a particular area of the body. Your peripheral nerves, right? So this one really targets, right, only known pathogen at that, that preferentially attacks peripheral nerves. And we talked about leprosy before, right, um, when we talked about in our immunology unit. So they grow it in armadillos and nude mice to be able to study it. It doesn't grow in artificial culture, right? And that's why they still have to use animal models. Um, like mycobacteria tuberculosis, this one can grow inside macrophages. Um, and it also attacks the, the cells associated with the peripheral nerves, the, the swan cells. So um, we still have new reported cases each year in the United States. I think we looked at the CDC's website at one point. And it was, we were down to about 80 now instead of 100, so that's pretty cool. Um, it's treated on an outpatient basis um, with antibiotics, of course, a combination of several antibiotics, um, depending on how your immune system is responding to that infection. Is, are you lepromatous leprosy, which means you're just doing an antibody response, which isn't good, um, are you tuberculoid, which is a little bit better, but can cause destruction to your own cells in the process of your cellular attack on that bacteria. So um, what's the main causative agent for viral meningitis? What are the ones that um, cause us to have an infection of the meninges caused by a virus? Nobody found this one? One of them we have a vaccine against, right? Which one do we have a vaccine against? 
So we usually don't see it causing viral meningitis. Enteroviruses, right? So entero referring to the intestine. So these are viruses that are common in our feces, right, in our intestines. So this, this is when they get out of there, get into the bloodstream, right, stretch. So they're, they're commonly transmitted fecal orally, right? Fecal contaminated food with these particular viruses. The mumps virus is transmitted differently, right, respiratorily and even by saliva. That one we have a vaccine against, right? Although not apparently a very effective vaccine, but we still have a vaccine. The enteroviruses are mainly um, summer and early fall um, transmission. And again, when we're going to be exposed to natural waters and things like that, increases the likelihood of spread. Um, and the mumps is more likely um, fall and winter. And this has to do, again, with the fact that we're, we tend to be inside in closer contact with larger numbers of people indoors um, under those time frames. So as always with any type of infectious disease, especially when we're dealing with fecal oral route, hand washing, right? Most important for prevention. Uh, avoiding crowded swimming pools right, during times, um, especially when we have outbreaks. And then for mumps, as we said, we can vaccinate. What's the difference between sporadic and epidemic viral and encephalopathies? Encephalopathies, ah, whatever. Infection of the brain, right? Inflammation of the brain. Infl yeah, I can't say it this morning. Okay, so sporadic is usually due to herpes simplex viruses, but other viruses, uh, including those that cause mumps, measles, and infectious mononucleosis, um, can cause um, that type of infection of the brain. Epidemic, right, which means something is spreading, right, um, over... A short period of time, a population is getting this infection. This is more commonly um, your arboviruses, which are viruses which are transmitted by insects. So can anyone think of one that we worry about here in Louisiana? We actually literally test our mosquitoes for it here. West Nile virus. Right, what's now? Okay. So, arboviral diseases we keep track of. There's several different ones that can cause infections of the brain. Um, like I said, the one that we worry m most commonly currently in, in Louisiana about is West Nile. Um, but these are some of the other ones that you'll hear about sometimes. Um, Eastern equine encephalitis uh, virus, uh, St. Louis. Um, here's a list. And they actually keep track of, like, did the infection go to the nervous system, right? So neuroinvasive versus non-neuroinvasive. Um, so for the Carolina um, Ciro group, uh, for Eastern Equine, um, here's another one I haven't even heard much about, um, Pawasani virus, uh, St. Louis, uh, and then there's West Nile, right? So, and as you can see, right, when do we see spikes in numbers? July, August, September, right? When mosquitoes are at their height, right? And we're outside. Um, does this mean that don't go outside? No, it just means, you know, like avoid times when they're very prevalent, right? At night. Um, and areas where they're very prevalent. Um, use preventative, right? Um, wear long sleeves. Use DEET, right? Um, 
some people can get the infection and their immune system handles it fine and it doesn't go neuroinvasive, right? But the unfortunate thing is for some people it does um, go to the central nervous system. Um, so this was, these were yearly numbers. So, um, you know, we've had some serious spikes in the past, right? Increases in the numbers of cases, unfortunately. I want to go over these. Um, what's the steps of the pathogenicity of rabies? So we already talked about this one, right? What's the problem with this virus? How does it get to the brain? It travels up the nerves, right? It travels up the nerves. So during the incubation period, the virus multiplies as the site of the bite, right, or the wound that was infected then travels via the nerves to the central nervous system. Here it multiplies and spreads outward via multiple nerves to infect even the heart and other organs. So it doesn't really just stop there. We know, right, to avoid contact with animals that may um, have this infection. For Louisiana, who are you avoiding? What wild animal population is the number one carrier of rabies in Louisiana? They're cute. Raccoons. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Um, um, we do have vaccine even for humans. Um, and antisera um, can be given. Uh, there's been so few people, thankfully. Um, we've been really good at avoiding <laughs> exposure to this virus. Um, that um, the few people that have had the infection and survived, um, because it's such a small number, we really don't know if the treatment that we did actually saved them or their immune system saved their ass. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm okay with not knowing the answer to that. Um, because the really the reason is is we don't have enough people who have gotten rabies to statistically know what's, what, what is effective. Do you understand what I mean by that? Right? So, um, you know, I'm all about the preventing it altogether. <laughs> I don't need to know how to how, how to effectively treat. Let's just not get it to begin with. So yeah, there's our scary little guys for Louisiana. Leave the raccoons alone. Um, it's really interesting though, too. I, I think I had found a picture. I don't remember if I posted it for this class or not. I'll have to see. Um, but you can search the internet. Um, when viruses multiply in the cells in the brain, um, they form these particular aggregates of the virus. Um, they're referred to as nigra bodies, right? N-E-G-R-I. Um, and this is one of the ways that they identify um, this particular virus. Um, they can identify it microscopically uh, because it forms, forms these unique and inclusion bodies uh, for this virus. And so um, pathologists, like, you know, they'll take samples of the brain tissue, they'll stain it, and they'll look it under, at it under the microscope, and they'll actually look for these um, aggregates, these inclusion bodies that form inside the cells that are unique to um, rabies. It's kind of cool. So the last one I think we have is um, African sleeping sickness, right? So again, the pathogenicity. And for this one... Um, the good news about us is I said Africa, right? <laughs> and there is a reason. This one, unlike Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which you can get in other places other than the Rocky Mountains, you really can only get African sleeping sickness um, in Africa. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is anyone know how, what um, insect transmits it? Tsetse fly. It's transmitted by the tsetse fly, which is only found in Africa, thankfully. So they can keep that little biter, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but don't be stupid like me and don't go to Africa because you're afraid of tsetse flies, right? You can avoid these types of things. Um, but the scary thing with this is it's a protozoa, right? So notice we moved on to protozoal diseases. Um, there are two, um, I don't know if they uh, refer to them as subspecies or strains, but uh, tr Tranosoma... Um, Brucei is the genus name or species name of the of the protozoa. 
there are two subspecies or different types, the Rhodesian and the Gambese. The Rhodesian infections progress quickly, right? Often the major system involvement within six weeks and death within six months. The other one, Gambese, infection progresses much more slowly. And this really has to do with where is the reservoir for these different subspecies. For the Rhodesian, it's actually the wild animal population harbor the protozoa that's picked up by the TC fly and then is transmitted to humans. So you can almost refer to this as a zoonotic disease, right? It's not very common to have this strain in humans. The Rhodesian, on the other hand, can be passed and is normally passed from person to person via the bite of an infected tsetse fly. So it makes sense, right, that this one progresses a lot slower in the human. Because if they kill off the human right away, can it be transmitted to other humans? It's less likely, right? So this one has adapted to actually not progress as quickly so therefore, it continues to be spread. So pathogenicity, it multiplies at the site of the tsetse fly bite, enters the bloodstream and lymphatic circulation. As new copies of the parasite are released, their surface proteins change, and the body is required to respond with a new antibody. So that's kind of horrifying, right? <laughs> so the parasite, each time it multiplies, it changes its surface antigens. It's continually mutating all the time. So you go through these waves, too, with it. Because you produce an antibody, but then it changes, right? So the next generation, you got to produce a new antibody to be able to attack it. Obviously, you want to prevent this. This is going to be your best thing. There are treatment. Right? D different antiprotozoals that can be used. Right. Without treatment, you will die. Um, eventually, your, your immune system just can't keep up. So they're pretty cool looking little protozoa under the microscope. Undulating <coughs> membranes. I got some trypanosoma cruzii, and I haven't even looked at the slide yet. I'm a bit too busy uh, for microbiology lab for the students to actually see these guys under the microscope. Prepared slides. You know, they're dead. <laughs> um, Cruzii we have here. Um, that one causes a little bit different disease um, known as um, Chagas disease. Um, and it's transmitted by the, they call it the kissing bug here, I think. It actually has a scientific name. Um, but they've had more and more problems with it nowadays um, with people getting infections um, with that particular protozoa from the kissing bug. Um, so we probably need to maybe add that one in and take out African sleeping sickness, actually talk about something here. All right, so that's it for nervous system. So for blood, I want to make sure we go over all the objectives quickly. So our heart valves, um, our circulatory valves, especially in our heart, are meant to keep flow going, right, in the proper direction, in the, in the correct way. Um, what's, what's the function of our lymphatic system? So remember, that drains the fluid when we have inflammation. We refer to that fluid as lymph. And that fluid could contain pathogens, right? 
So do we, what do we have that's going to help protect us against anything that gets us in our lymph? Our lymph nodes, right? So um, our lymphatic system, right, helps us recirculate, right, our fluid from inflammation, but we do this in a safe manner where we're going to actually um, filter that lymph and trap any foreign things. What about your spleen? It's part of your lymphatic system because it filters, doesn't it? But what does it filter? It filters your blood, right? It is, it is your filter for your blood. So you're more susceptible if you don't have a spleen, but you don't have to have a spleen to live, unlike a heart or a brain, you know, those other important organs. Um, so for subacute uh, bacterial <coughs> endocarditis, um, it's pathogenicity. Usually it's normal microbiota that enter into the bloodstream through dental procedures or other trauma. So it's your own bacteria that usually create the problems. And usually only for individuals that have abnormal hearts, spe specifically um, defects to their valves of their heart. Um, this creates more turbulent flow, um, leaves them more susceptible to bacteria actually attaching to those valves or the inner lining of the heart. Um, you would think turbulence would help us, but in this case it does not. Um, and this creates a real problem too, right, because of where it's located. It's, um, it's really hard for the immune system to actually get to those areas to fight the infection. Because flow is under so much pressure, right, and so quickly that the white blood cells, even though they're in your blood, they don't have the ability to grab on in that region, right? Because remember, how they help us with inflammation is that the, the endothelial cells of the, of the veins are going to express those selectins so that they can grab on and they can travel into the tissue, right? In this case, we don't have that architecture as it applies to the heart, right? We, we don't have that protection, although we don't really necessarily need it if you have a normal heart. And so the problem is people who have abnormalities in their heart um, will deal with usually these types of infections. So people who know they have these types of abnormalities can um, prevent usually these types of things from happening. So people who have um, these types of heart valve defects commonly when they go to the dentist or before they go to the dentist, especially for cleaning where they're going to scrape around the gums and potentially um, cause them to bleed <coughs> and then the normal flora of the mouth could enter in, um, they're going to have them take antibiotics ahead of time so that anything that does get into the bloodstream um, gets killed before it gets to the heart and can't take up residency. Um, so that's one of the things that they'll do to help prevent these types of infections. And the problem is, is that, you know, they can stick. They can form biofilms. They can get in there, and we really can't get at them um, effectively. So we really want to avoid um, this happening because um, it can cause a pretty serious infection that's next to impossible to treat. So endotoxins, remember, where do these come from? What, what type of bacteria produce the endotoxin that we worry about? Gram negative because they have an outer membrane. That outer membrane is made of LPS. The lipid component is the endotoxin. So this is endotoxin anemia. So anemia refers to your blood. So this is when we've got it circulating in the blood. This is worst case scenario, y'all. So what are we, the effects, right? So the effects are not good, right? Violet shaking, chills and fever accompanied by anxiety and rapid breathing. In the case of shock, right, where you've got so much endotoxin circulating through the bloodstream, urine output is going to drop, right? We're not getting enough blood circulation throughout the body, enough perfusion, respiration and pulse become rapid, arms and legs become cool and dusky colored. So this is gram negative 
And they're the more likely to cause um, what's referred to as fatal septicemia, where you have an infection of uh, bacteria in the bloodstream. And then you could lead to this massive release of endotoxins. So shock is common with people with an infection to this level, right, of the blood itself. There, despite even treatment, there's a 50% mortality rate. Because at this point it's gotten to, it's just, it's just too much. Right. And when you're talking about your blood, you're talking about the superhighway, right? So E. coli, um, uh, uh, Pseudomonas, um, several bacteroides, right? And again, they're really going to have to quickly figure out what bacterial infections you have, how best to treat it, what are the numbers looking like, how bad is the damage already. This is a really tricky infection. So if any of you guys know um, Fred Toro, he's a uh, professor in business. He's over on the West Bank now. He almost died. He had septicemia and was hospitalized. And he goes, at the time, he goes, I didn't have a clue. He goes, and then afterwards, he was like, oh, my God, I could have died. Like, so easily I could have died. Um, and, and he's like, okay, I kind of understand now why your class is important, Miss <laughs> Right. Why, why it's important to know about bacteria and viruses and, and what they could do to us and, and what do we have to protect ourselves. Um, so, let's see. Tularemia versus brucellosis. And in this one, I really want you guys to kind of focus in on the epidemiology. So what does that mean? Right? That means, like, where, where are these things coming from? Like, how are we getting exposed to it? How is it getting transmitted to humans? So another name for tularemia is rabbit fever. Um, so it's a present among the wild animal population. It's caused by a bacteria, right? People who are at risk are, of course, people who have exposure to wild animal populations. So hunters, trappers, game wardens, people who handle wildlife. And so we... You know, there, it's going to enter into the body via mucous membranes or penetrations, broken skin. Um, so this happens when individuals are skinning rabbits, right? So you're exposed to the bacteria inside of them, and you're not wearing what? Gloves. What else, guys? Goggles, right? You really should be wearing a face mask when you're doing these types of things, right? Because the animal is not cooked yet, it's raw. When you're skinning it, you're being exposed to these things. You can inhale this, right, and come in contact with your mucous membranes and get this infection, right? Most people, unfortunately, do not wear enough personal protective gear when dressing animals after um, killing them in a hunt. Um, so... The other way that you can get this, though, is a bite of an infected tick, right? Um, and occasionally inhalation, right, um, where you're inhaling. Actually get it in respiratorily. Um, so vaccination for high-risk individuals, but, you know, we always, all the time, right, we want to avoid, I don't know anybody who likes to get bit by insects anyways, right? Sure, cuckoo bananas, we're going to avoid that. Um, but really, you know, like I said, um, you know, protecting ourselves. And definitely rabbits, that's why it's commonly referred to as rabbit fever, are one of the major carriers of this particular bacteria. Um, other animals can carry it, though. Um, don't be eluded by the fact that rabbits are the main one. <coughs> no, they list the other ones here. They don't. Um, so what's going to happen... Um, this is one of those cases where a lot of times um, the lymph nodes are going to enlarge, right, um, with that type of infection, that's some type of a clue in. And then depending on what you've done, right, will give your doctor some clue as to what may have happened. Um, so I think doctors in Louisiana are smart enough to, to ask their patients, have you been hunting lately, right? <laughs> um, what activities have you um engaged in may have put you at risk for a type of um, infection that would cause these type of lymph node um, uh, 
enlargements. So brucellosis, also referred to as undulant fever, um, main sources of human infections are domestic animals. So unlike wild animals, these are animals that we've domesticated. Uh, it also incur occurs in wild animal populations, though, although most of us usually aren't exposed to them. Um, and individuals who drink unpasteurized milk are at risk. Um, so this is a bacterial infection again. Um, it is very common in domestic animals. The good news as it relates to that for our domestic animals, we do have vaccination. Um, the problem is, is this is a highly infectious bacteria. Um, and um, it can cause abortion in um, cattle. And so you can lose an entire cattle herd if you have this infection go through your herd very, very quickly, very rapidly. The bison in Yellowstone National Park, they've um, developed a vaccination program for them uh, to help protect them. Uh, but also because if they get out of Yellowstone National Park and they get onto any of the cattle ranches nearby, the cattle ranchers will shoot them immediately for fear they may be carrying brucellosis and could transmit it very easily to their herd. And like I said, you'll lose an entire herd um, because it will cause the mothers to abort um, their babies. Uh, and it also gets transmitted into the milk, and that's um, how humans would come in contact with it. It doesn't cause abortion in, um, in humans, though, surprisingly. Um, but again, it can cause a pretty serious infection of the lymph nodes. Um, and of course, um, we do have um, treatment because it is a bacterial infection. Um, so we vaccinate our animals to help protect us. We pasteurize our milk to help protect us um, against um, getting this type of infection. In order to do work in research with this bacteria um, in trying to develop a, a human vaccine, you have to go through a background check um, through the government uh, in order to work in the lab at LSU uh, because it is listed as a bioterrorist agent. I just said it doesn't cause abortion in people, right? doesn't really make us all that sick. I mean, so why is it considered a bioterrorist agent? What would I say? What would it do to a cattle herd? It could wipe out an entire cattle herd. Go look in the grocery store, y'all. Go look in your own refrigerator. How much beef do you eat? How much beef do we consume in the United States? A lot. Right? A lot. That would be one of our main food sources wiped out if someone attacked it with brucellosis. That's why it's on the list. Because it would attack a food source for us and potentially eliminate it. <clears throat> All right, I know I'm out of time. I'm going to post an old lecture for you guys, but I think there's only a couple left that are pretty easy. I do have an old lecture this time. Yeah, most of this.